Hello everyone. Welcome to this business continuity podcast brought to you by Continuity and Resilience. My name is Dheeraj Lal and I welcome you to this episode which is part of our business continuity best of the best series. I'm today in conversation with Chris Miller who's a past recipient of the Australasia Award for Business Continuity Industry Personality of the Year awarded by the BCI, the Business Continuity Institute. Given Chris's huge list of accomplishments, she clearly has in a day much more than the 24 hours that I have in mind. I can't wait to get an idea of all the great things that Chris has been up to and looking forward to hear her take on the COVID-19, the shape of things to come, artificial intelligence, and the future of business continuity. Chris also shares with us the huge economic impact that the COVID-19 has had on the Australian economy, which in fact could drag down things for the next 20 years. So let's hear what Chris has to say. Chris Miller, welcome to Business Continuity with Friends. You've had a fascinating journey. You started off in emergency response. You then got a business continuity opportunity, which you took because only you thought it would be three months. It's now been almost 15 years and you've spent time now on response, recovery, all stages of the cycle. Even before the current pandemic happened, you spent time on infectious diseases, going back to the old SARS. So frankly, you have absolutely relevant experience for the current situation, like no one I've ever seen before. Tell us about your journey. How's it been? What brought you here and how have things been so far? Well, thanks very much for this opportunity to share some ideas with your listeners. Uh, Business continuity, like many business continuity managers, it was almost accidental. As you pointed out, I had long experience in emergency management. And after the Indian Ocean tsunami of uh, 2004, 26th of December 2004, which adversely impacted in your country, uh, and many others around the um, Indian ocean area. I was pretty tired after that. The 16 hour days, seven days a week for weeks on end really started to um, tire me out. Plus I was also doing the first anniversary for the Bali bombing survivors that went back to Bali to honor their loved ones and a couple of other matters which are more, um, more, I need to be more circumspect about. But anyway, all in all, I was a bit of a crispy critter as we would say in Australia, I was a bit burnt out. So my deputy at the time in the Australian government working for the Department of Social Services said, I'm looking for someone to do business continuity for three months. Mm -hmm. And I went, do what? Oh, he said, well, see if you can make the transition from emergency management to business continuity. Well, 15 years ago, that is, almost (laughs) in a few days' time, it'll be exactly... (laughs) And that's a lucky stroke. Not many people get that, manage to make the transition. So so that's unique. Well, I've often described it as I used to be in the business of emergency management for all of Australia or significant numbers of Australians or significant piece of Australia at the time. Now I'm in the business of trying to save one business at a time. So it's a matter of scale. Exactly. And it all matters. <laughs> Um, Let's come to the emergency response experience. Um, You've done a lot of work in that whole area, including infectious diseases, even before the COVID-19. What have been your learning so far and how do you see things going from here? Well, as you rightly pointed out, I started in health emergencies dating back to AIDS, HIV. And I've dwelt on that experience because for quite a while, like COVID, it was very scary. You may not recall that far back, but it was a very scary time because we didn't have the basic science. We didn't really understand what we were up against. And Dr. Anthony Fauci, Tony, who you will have seen on various um, media reports, one of the great epidemiologists of America, it was him that actually worked it out. He worked out that it was young men who were otherwise quite healthy, were dying and quite rare diseases. And then he gradually pieced it together, the good epidemiologist that he is, and worked out what was going on. And as I've explained to a number of my clients, we've learned to live with 
AIDS, HIV. We've got quite reasonable treatments now. They're fairly complex treatments, similar to heart transplants or other transplant uh, drugs, but we still have no vaccine and it's still a deadly disease. So in trying to reassure them that based on this experience, it will be possible for us to learn to live with COVID. Certainly, we would have to make significant social changes to the way we do business, the way we interact with one another, and on a much bigger scale than we've had to do with AIDS, HIV, of course. And another interesting thing, I've done some work on future of work. So even some of the businesses such as couriers, I don't know if this has been the case in your country, we seem here to have uh, developed a great taste for online shopping, mm -hmm. yep. which means we, need, we have a lot of packages and a lot of courier deliveries. Right. So but what we've been seeing in other places, for example, in Wuhan, when they had their lockdown, they were actually experimenting with robot courier deliveries. Yes, yes yeah. So they would send you your, um, your code, they would pilot the robot down the road, it would stop in front of your apartment building, They'd say, robot here now, Correct. you'd run down into the code, up would come the, the lip, you'd get out your package, run back upstairs, and they'd pilot the robot back. Yeah, yeah. So there's all sorts of exciting developments, particularly in the AI, digitization, robot spaces, to improve the contactless right. world. And talking to some of the CIOs, the chief information officers, chief technology officers, they're incredibly excited. Mm. Some of them say that they're their forward plans for five years have been brought forward Absolutely. because they needed to do these things to make remote, remote working possible. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's receptiveness to all of this. It's, it's literally the right time to do it. So. Yes, but there's a downside to it too. Because of the hasty jump, as I've called it, ski jump, because I used mm. to be a skier, yeah. into a good response, we might have left behind some things that we not, might need to recover. And a number of businesses I've worked for, I remember suggesting to them about more remote working. And they'd say, oh, no, 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 that's impossible because of security, because of this, because of that. And are those businesses are now working remotely. And I'm thinking, did anyone do a risk assessment on your cyber security controls? Yeah. Because the only way that some of them would have been able to quickly action remote working for some aspects of their business was to just pull out unplug a whole lot of cyber security controls, right. possibly right. without a risk assessment. Now, this is no criticism of the CTOs or CIOs or CISOs or others who did this. They were probably directed from on high, make it happen. Yeah. But now that we've we largely settled into what we call COVID normal in Australia, in most uh, locations, we need to reflect back. What do we leave behind? Mm. Are there some important features of cyber security that we need to re-engage with, that we at least need to do a risk assessment about. And sometimes people left hit critical parts of their business behind because they were so busy right. trying yeah. to yeah. under COVID, they just took what they could and ran out the door as the oh. expression. And whether we can recapture some of those parts of yeah. the business and make them value adding parts of your business in a COVID oh. safe way in COVID normal. And also looking forward, I've been encouraging my clients and colleagues to look forward towards post-COVID, which may be as soon as five years plus. I mean, allowing a reasonable amount of time for the vaccines to roll out, which right. looks like starting to happen, possibly as soon as later this year, but possibly more likely next year before we'll see large numbers. And it may be more than the Pfizer vaccine, as I said, some of my intel from the Americans is some others that are close to making similar announcements. And we all look forward to that. But so, but even so, if you look at the uh, prioritisation of vaccinations, the first people will obviously be frontline healthcare workers because there's so much in the front line. And then at the second phase would be helpful people like police, fire, ambulance, truck drivers, people involved in keeping us alive in other ways with the supply of food and, and essential um, products like fuel. <laughs> My gas ran out a few moments ago, as you know. This. So I'd like the gas man to keep coming too. That'd be handy. I'd like to be able to cook on my nice new stove. We had a kitchen replacement. So those kind of helpful people. And then on the third trench, it appears that that will be people 65 and over or people with um, pre-existing health conditions, such as my sister who's had a lifetime of asthma. 
and then other essential workers before we get to everyone else, which right. is myself and possibly you too. Uh, so if you allow for the amount of mass manufacturing and distribution and arrangements for inoculation, I'm doing some work with some people in the National Hall Service in the UK, all this is going to take time. Oh. None of this is going to happen in a blink. So two to five years seems like a reasonable time horizon. It may actually be shorter, and of course we all hope it will be. Right. In the interim, we may have to put up with more outbreaks and the like, such as we're just re reporting in South Australia today, one of the Australian states that had gone months without a COVID case, and hey presto, they've now got community transmission again. So uh, until the vaccine is widely distributed and the world effective, yeah. Mm -hmm. World Health Organization anticipates we need 70% of the world's population vaccinated. Yeah. Now, the current estimate of the world's population is 7.8 billion. 70% is 5.46. If it's the Pfizer vaccine, you need two injections about three weeks apart, and it needs to be continuously kept at cold chain, at ultra cold chain, mm -hmm. which is 70 degrees Celsius, 90 degrees Fahrenheit is going to be a challenge in many countries, yeah. including your home country and mine. So uh, none of this is going to be quick. There's going to require a huge amount of effort. It will be, as I said to um, another group earlier today, it'll be bigger than World War III. The logistics and complexity of this yeah. will be greater than another world war to deliver because the war at present is against a virus. Absolutely. Um, just as uh, the tech folks have in some ways accelerated their plans, uh, do you see this entire uh, episode accelerating the move towards organizational resilience and making it all come together? Maybe. Uh, but unfortunately, what we've observed in Australia is some business uh, continuity managers are losing their roles. Which is it's a very worst possible time. Yeah, which is Sorry? which is which is counterintuitive and yes. unfortunate. That's what you need more than anything else at this point in time. So. Yes, but it appears some of the C suite don't quite understand what their business continuity managers can do for them. And uh, I often see my role as being in two parts. One is to work with a client to smooth out the business as usual so that it is less vulnerable, less likely to fail, more resilient. Um, more intuitive towards near misses and lower grade incidents and dealing with them and doing after action reviews or post incident reviews if you prefer to try and tweak the plans to make them more resilient because I see it in a sliding scale. We actually want to make the business so resilient that they don't even need the business right. continuity plan exactly. because they, they jump on every little near miss or problem early in the and there's a, a school of thinking called high reliability organisations, high re reliability management, which has uh, come out of nuclear power stations. Uh -huh. I'm relieved to hear that they are in the business of trying to push um, needing their business continuity plan a long way up. Mm -hmm. the yeah, yeah. But those, those sort of thinkings can be brought into businesses that are less um, critical in terms of likely to kill us all if it goes badly. Uh, but... Uh, those ideas, I think, are important ones in the resiliency space, but you achieve that by exercising, by jumping on your near misses, by dealing with your lower grade incidents that may not be quite enough to trigger your business continuity plan or may trigger parts of it, and trying to find, glean those understandings and reinforce those back into your business. Right. So that's the kind of make your business as usual more resilient approach. Mm -hmm. As I say, what are we going to do in a crisis? If all those good ideas fail, then what? And that's, that's why I see my work as in two parts. Makes sense, absolutely. Um, what advice would you have to a new entity who did not have BCM and kind of got thrown into COVID, managed, but in some ways, uh, hopefully there's now a light bulb as to what more, the, as, as to the need to do more, um, so what would you tell a new entity who now realizes that they need to do something and, and what are your three, four, five suggestions that they should do to put in place formal, structured, effective resilience? 
Yes, well, I, I actually have a client that fits in that category uh, who had been contemplating business continuity and then along came COVID and all of a sudden <laughs> CEO on the line, we need you, no, no, no. Yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> and, of course, it's all a bit late. We're in the middle of COVID response, but no, we've managed to uh, move forward. And one of the ways we did that was not to undertake the usual exhaustive detailed business impact analysis, the activity operational level, BIA, we kept it at a tactical level and tried to do it at the highest possible level so that they got something quick right. and also agile and flexible because with this outbreak, return to restrictions, uh, freeing of restrictions, this kind of environment, I think we need to be very much on the front foot to use a cricket analogy, I hope. So um, many businesses have taken a colossal hit and we, I don't think we've fully seen the, the numbers of bankruptcies that we are likely to see in the coming months, years, yeah. how long it'll take to completely wash through the economy. If you look at the uh, GFC, the global financial crisis, we lost 0.1% uh, of the uh, global GDP. The current figures are more than 5% of the global GDP. It was 0.1 for the GFC. Wow. It was 10 years to recover the jobs and businesses we lost in Australia mm. from 0.1%. How long do you think it'll take us to recover 5%? And some figures quote as high as 7 So uh, yeah, the business world in Australia is very challenging and it requires businesses to be very agile, flexible, Back to that front foot, the cricket analogy, yeah. looking for opportunities, doing things differently, perhaps rescaling their businesses. So to give you a real example, obviously hand sanitizers become very popular <laughs> as it has been, I no doubt, in other places. We're not allowed to travel overseas anymore. The borders are closed for us. Exactly, yeah. But I assume if I came to visit you in your location, there'd be lots of hand sanitizers. <laughs> so we've had um, distilleries alcohol distilleries that have made to, yeah, things yeah. to drink to things on the hand. That's right, yeah. Kind of looking for the opportunity, trying to anticipate mm -hmm. with moving into the future. And that's why it's important to look at that five year plus sort of planning that I'm doing with some clients and some colleagues. It's, so even even businesses like couriers have done extremely well mm -hmm. during the, the pandemic period here because of online shopping for how much longer? Yeah. What if that becomes robotised instead of going on? Right. human deliveries? In Australia, in, in Canberra, in the southern areas of Canberra, we've been trialling drone deliveries for yeah. Amazon. So where is all that going to take us? Of course, a lot of that will unfold under the pressure and, and pushing of things like COVID because it's a very disruptive thing. Absolutely. But it's interesting to think about the dark ages coming out of the Black Plague, as terrible as that was. It led to the renaissance. Mm. One can possibly think, hopefully, what will COVID take us to? If the Dark Ages, the three centuries of plague, by the way, took us into the renaissance, yeah. what will post-COVID be? And as I said earlier, many of the CIOs are t telling me that their, their five-year plan has been compressed, right. not, not in five years' time. So they now have to start to think, what do I want? Where do I want to position this business in two, five, ten years yeah. in terms of their digitisation? So it could be a very exciting time. A scary time, but an exciting time. A, 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 a volatile mix. Uh, there's a statement I read once which said it's darkest before dawn. Uh, mm. so, so let's see where this darkness leads. Uh, on that note, Chris, thank you very much uh, for an absolutely fascinating range of subjects. Um, I particularly liked the entire reference to where the world is going through the last part of the conversation. Um, so thanks a lot. I, I hope our, the people who see the video would love it. And thanks once again uh, for your time and your thoughts and wish you all the best. Thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity. And you know where I am. You can always find me on LinkedIn. Absolutely. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank bye you. bye.